vous propose que nous commencions cette euh, séance sur le, la puissance numérique. Et le lien est assez évident avec la séance précédente, puisque, comme cela a été indiqué, un des enjeux de la compétition de, de puissance réside précisément dans la, dans la quête de la supériorité technologique. Et donc, on va avoir une continuité euh, très évidente entre la séance qui vient de se dérouler et euh, celle que je vais animer. Alors, il y a trois questions euh, qui euh, ont orienté notre, euh, la préparation de cette séance sur la puissance numérique. La première question, c'est de savoir si euh, le numérique modifie la nature de la puissance. Est-ce qu'au fond, le numérique accélère la dispersion de la puissance entre les différents acteurs ou au contraire, est-ce que le numérique euh, accentue la concentration euh, de puissance Ça, c'est une première question que nous allons essayer de, de traiter. La deuxième question euh, va porter sur, je dirais, les attributs de la puissance numérique. Au fond, comment chercher à la définir, à la caractériser Quels sont les points à observer pour essayer précisément d'apprécier euh, au plus juste ce qu'est une puissance numérique et puis la troisième question que nous allons nous, nous, nous poser ce matin, c'est celle de la hiérarchie de puissance. Est-ce qu'au fond, le numérique est en train de modifier la hiérarchie de puissance, à la fois au sens classique du terme, c'est-à-dire entre, entre pays, entre nations, mais également avec l'apparition d'acteurs privés qui bénéficient aujourd'hui de moyens tout à fait inédits historiquement qui leur permettent aussi de rentrer dans un jeu de puissance voilà les, les trois questions qui, qui vont structurer euh, nos discussions. Alors, nous avons euh, trois panélistes pour, euh, pour les traiter. Je vais commencer par euh, donner la parole à Patrick Nicolet, qui est le euh, Chief Technological Officer du groupe euh, Capgemini. Ensuite, je me tournerai vers euh, Jean-Louis euh, Gergorin, euh, qui euh, vient de publier un livre qui s'appelle « Cyber, la guerre permanente ». Et nous finirons avec euh, Merchetritz, qui est un habitué de la World Policy Conference, et il me rappelait qu'il avait, euh, avait participé au, au panel sur le cyber il y a maintenant six ans, lors de la World Policy Conference de, de Monaco. Donc Patrick, si tu le veux bien, je te donne la parole pour, euh, pour commencer. Thank you, uh, Thomas. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, there is a nice segue with the previous session, but there are also some overlaps, so I will try to address it, not repeat what was said before, but also for the ones who have not been there in the previous session, I will summarize some of the aspects. My point, my focus today is to present why it matters for corporate, the corporate world, why it matters is this question of cyber power, cyber threats matter for the enterprise, and uh, what does it mean for the corporate world. Uh, we've been working on these topics with Thomas uh, for more than two years now. Mm -hmm. uh, we published last year a study on the geopolitical impact of data. We've been working this year on the, the definition and the notion of cyber power. And uh, to the point mentioned by John Sowers before, uh, we've looked at uh, there is another study on the uh, on one application case that is the concept of uh, a uh, smart city viewed by China, which in fact is uh, all, all about security. So you can find a pre-release of these studies here uh, in, the, in the library in the Pasio. So be building on this uh, from an enterprise perspective, uh, there are three constituencies the way I see it uh, when it comes to cyber power and related to the enterprise. The first one is obviously the state. Uh, the state, and for the state, what we see, nothing new, we heard it this morning, uh, network is power. Uh, if you, without related to any cyber things, uh, the, the fleet, the dominance in the sea uh, created the basis for the British Empire, and it was all about the network and how you manage it. The same applies today to uh, cyber security. The states tend to focus on infrastructure, as you heard this morning. The states are focused on data centers where they collect uh, uh, and control the data that are related to their uh, activities in the, in the country. Uh, submarine communication cable, as we know. Uh, wireless communication, this has been mentioned again this morning, the question about who owns the technology and the 5G. Uh, but in any case, for every state, uh, cyber is sovereign and as strategic as nuclear from a defense perspective. So you will hear more later on. 
Uh, that was the beginning. Uh, didn't affect much the enterprise, but now states are moving into managing data and artificial intelligence, the meaning the use of what they collect on their infrastructure. And uh, that's the case notably uh, that you heard this by uh, state control uh, agencies uh, called uh, with a nice acronym APT for Advanced Persistent Threat, which tell what it is. They are persistent and they are uh, after us. They try to take, if you look at a company like Capgemini, uh, we are a platform to access the network of, uh, of our clients. So uh, they just want to go in, take position, and then decide when they want to access. So we, we are uh, under pressure constantly. Uh, we have the pleasure also to face uh, countries like North Korea who have two types of attack. One, uh, the ones I described, the other one to make money because uh, it's also a way to make money. So they have different groups uh, that attacks us and the best known uh, type of threat is so-called ransomware. So comes block either denial of services or block your system, block your access and they make it free. There are other ways uh, to make money uh, using the enterprise infrastructure is to go in uh, exploit the infrastructure to mine Bitcoin. Uh, so you have a very free infrastructure and uh, you can charge for the service you uh, give to the cryptocurrency management. So we have to address all of this, but we are not part of anything of this as, a, as an enterprise. The consequences for us is that uh, very materially, uh, it increases our uh, uh, information system budget by at least 10% which we didn't have before. So it is adding, and it is, from an economic standpoint, hurting our competitiveness. But we have no choice. We have to face it. And uh, on top, you have regulations coming on it. So in Europe, there is a so-called NIS directive for network and information security that defines by country what are the critical infrastructure, meaning companies, and what are the critical system within this critical information, and we have to deploy solutions, paid or not paid by the clients, but anyhow for the economy is a cost, in order to address uh, this threat. So this is an immediate impact, uh, but it's just the first one related to state. Now, the next actor uh, in the cyber power are the tech giants. Uh, we heard a little bit about it this morning, but where did they come from? The tech giants, if you think, uh, beat US and Chinese, because they are the only places where you find tech giants today. Uh, they started with uh, software and data. Uh, Microsoft has started with software, Google with a search engine, Facebook and Google as well exploiting uh, insights, meaning what you can get from data uh, through advertising. And then they move into the infrastructure world, because as they were processing more and more and more data, it has a cost. They said, well, we can impose to the consumer a standard way of doing it. And by the way, if we do it efficiently, uh, it's better for our business and it will add the lines of revenue. And when you see uh, Amazon is a perfect example. Amazon is a book company and an e-commerce company was not making any profits. That was the approach. Hyper growth, it's a model in the, in the West Coast. Hyper growth, very well. Uh, Financial uh, participants have followed, but when you look at AWS, which is the cloud division of Amazon, they are making a lot of benefit and they are making a strong contribution to the current market cap. So now these tech giants are becoming rivals of the states. Uh, if you look at the size to start with, uh, I don't know if you read it, but uh, when uh, Mark Zuckerberg welcomed uh, Prime Minister Modi from India in his headquarters at Facebook, he joked comparing their respective population, telling Mr. Modi, you know, I have 1.6 billion active users per day, and your population actually is a little bit smaller than mine, so if I were a state, I would be bigger than you. That's about uh, the type of exchanges that you can hear. The, the other point is the wealth. They, these companies have generated a huge amount of, of wealth. When, when you look at the, the, their market cap, which is in trillion range, but when you look at the investment capacity they have, uh, Google and Amazon both independently 
have spent over the last 12 months $40 billion of CapEx on R&D. $40 billion. Uh, Apple and uh, Facebook, 25. That's uh, small players. But uh, Apple has the largest cash reserve uh, from all tech giants uh, above the 120 billion range. So they have huge, huge means uh, available. And I come back on this why it matters to, for the rest of the economy. And then there is a power struggle in the US. There is a power struggle, you read it, because it goes too far. And, and then uh, when you listen to, for instance, uh, Elizabeth Warren in his campaign, uh, in her campaign, sorry, she's for dismantling. That's something that the US has been uh, through many times. You think of train, you think of oil, it has always been the same. You, they build giant and they go after it, dismantle them, at least optically, not effectively, but optically, yes. And then uh, they continue and they start all over again. So we just need to check for the next wave of technology development. But there is a power struggle. The point is, though, that the same happened in China, where you have the Tencent, which is, in my view, the most powerful company, followed by uh, Alibaba, Baidu, Xiaomi. So these are the, the equivalent of the GAFAM, the Chinese equivalent, except that in China there is no power struggle. This has been settled from the start. And that's changed the picture, because that is an accelerating factor for this company, just that their influence zone when you think of Tencent Alibaba, is much more Asia than the rest of the world, though uh, AliCloud, the cloud division of Alibaba, which is, could be, not totally, could be compared with uh, Amazon, is growing as well in Europe and, and in the US. So, and you heard this morning uh, in the previous session about uh, the discussion on the technology uh, with, uh, with Huawei. Now, the impact on the enterprise uh, is significant because we all move digital, and I will explain why we all move digital. You heard from Francois Barrault this morning about the move to the cloud. Once you've done this transition, uh, you are faced with managing complex environments. Running your operation in the cloud is not that easy. And, and all, the more that you move to something that is interesting from a business standpoint, the so-called as-a-service model, where basically you trade off your capital expenditure with operational expenditure, which is good if you don't have the means of the tech giants, but then you're dependent of the consumption and you're dependent of the supplier on this cloud world today, including for security, cybersecurity reason, and uh, uh, provide lock-ins. And these lock-ins limit your bargaining power with the tech giants. And trust me, because I'm negotiating them for us and our client, it's not rare to see year over year 30 to 50 percent price increase. 30 to 50 percent price increase on on the on the activity you have with these tech giants, which is a lot to absorb in an economy with a limiting bargaining power. So you need to develop uh, alternative strategy, but it's a direct consequence. And part of this price is that you need to buy features to protect your data and to protect your systems. And this is the way these uh, bundles are built by the tech giants. So if you listen to this, and I will conclude, if you listen to this, you say, well, why do you go there? Frankly, uh, stay home and uh, continue to write with your pen. Uh, unfortunately, you cannot. You cannot because you're pushed by the technology development. These technology development, as we heard this morning, are available for a lot of people. There is a lot of capital av available. So a lot of startup, a lot of scale up, a lot of unicorn, etc., And they become <laughs> threat to you. So if you don't do it, you're in trouble. And then your competitors, the incumbent that are established, will do the same. So you, and we heard uh, Jean-Paul Lagon yesterday saying he is operating in the so-called VUCA world, uh, the volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. And it's part of the operations. And, and you need the technology in order to have this agility and to be able to cope with the other challenges, such as deglobalization that force you for decentralization. And then my last uh, contribution to, for the debate, uh, talking, I believe we have an opportunity, uh, in particular in Europe, to regain control, uh, is about supporting the emergence of new cyber power. And I explained briefly. 
If you are an automotive company today, you have basically three types of assets. Uh, engineering, your supply chain, including manufacturing, your distribution, including your brands. Tomorrow, you will be electric, autonomous, com com uh, connected, and you will deliver a large set of services. Just think, if you're an autonomous car, you will be bored, so the company will have to provide you entertainment. This is how do you allocate the assets and, and, and how do you build uh, the, the, the power. And I, I believe here, our large industrial companies in the B2B2C area could become uh, superpowers, technology superpowers tomorrow uh, because they will be consuming mm -hmm. a lot of the technologies and they will make use of it. And in that sense, I think the decision of not authorizing uh, Siemens and Alstom in the train industry to merge is in my view a big mistake because as I mentioned, you need a lot of capital. And then the link to the cyber threat to conclude is that I mean, this is here to stay because we, will, we are going towards a connected world. We have the challenges and uh, this is part of the new world. Welcome, thank you. Thank you, Patrick. I think that your very last point you know, on uh, Alstom and Siemens could be also a very interesting point for our debate. So I move now to Jean-Louis for, for, for his um, presentation. Jean-Louis, the floor is yours. Um, merci, uh, Thomas. Um, je vais uh, commencer en français uh, pour simplement dire que uh, la façon dont j'aborde le cyber, c'est que le cyber n'est pas est à la fois évidemment extrêmement lié à la cybersécurité, c'est-à-dire à, à l'ensemble euh, des techniques et des analyses euh, de, des attaques d'intrusion informatique, qu'elles soient à des fins d'espionnage ou de sabotage ou d'extorsion financière, mais elle est en même temps plus, plus large et plus euh, limitée. Euh, en effet, euh, pour moi, euh, le, le cyber, le cyber, c'est... Euh, la continuation, pour paraphraser Clausewitz, la continuation de la politique par d'autres moyens. C'est une autre forme, une forme moderne, une des formes modernes de la continuation de la politique par d'autres moyens, autre que la guerre. Parce que je vais effectivement me concentrer sur le cyber en temps de paix, qui est à mon avis le plus pernicieux. Parce que le cyber en temps de guerre, qui est évidemment utilisé, par exemple les, les Américains ont neutralisé les défenses aériennes irakiennes au début de la guerre euh, de 2003, euh, mais il existe actuellement toutes sortes, tous les moyens. Euh, euh, ceci s'intègre dans les défenses militaires. Euh, en revanche, le cyber en temps de paix euh, correspond alors à, une, à, à une tendance qui se généralise actuellement et qu'on a vu hier, avec le, notamment lors de, du débat sur le lawfare, avec le très brillant exposé de la professeure Neurodome, c'est euh, atteindre des objectifs politiques et stratégiques sans combattre. Je vous rappelle que Sun Tzu, le père de la stratégie historique, le père historique de la stratégie, a dit « Vaincre sans combattre est le comble du, tombe, du comble pour le stratège ». Et, et donc, c'est ce que nous allons essayer de discuter. Donc, je passe euh, à l'anglais pour dire « What are... Uh, »« uh, So, if we once we have thus defined cyber, what are the main tools, uh, vehicles to... » Uh, reach uh, strategic goals uh, through cyber. And there are, in fact, two main ways to do it that are more and more integrated and more and more perpetrated by the same aggressors. Uh, the first one is hacking, which is a, uh, uh, the uh, antagonistic penetration uh, of uh, uh, IT uh, networks. Uh, in order to steal information, to sabotage, or to uh, blackmail, to get a ransom, to so-called ransomware. So, but there is another way, uh, which is to reach a political goal through a strategic goal through the manipulation of digital media. Uh, the most common way is uh, the um, um, uh, manipulation of the major so social media, social media. And we have seen that, uh, for example, in the uh, uh, 2016 election, uh, a presidential election, where a, a number of uh, uh, so-called fake accounts, uh, uh, what uh, uh, 
uh, and uh, other, uh, what uh, the uh, experts call sockets. It means accounts that we are pretending uh, to be uh, of uh, 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 black power partisans or white supremacists, but all based in the US, accounts on Facebook or on Twitter or on Instagram or YouTube. And in fact, they were manipulated. It has never been really denied, you know, uh, by uh, the Internet Research Agency of St. Petersburg, uh, which is just, uh, I think, if I, uh, the uh, president of Russia has said that uh, there was absolutely no link between this organization and the US government, and he mentioned, as well as uh, the US government pretends that he has no links with the various NGOs that have been interfering in Russian domestic politics. And uh, so uh, it's one way, uh, manipulation of social media, and the extraordinary power of social media gives, uh, is obviously makes this way very, very effective. And we have, uh, there is a, a new ways because the, the digital media are not limited to social media. And there is a new, uh, and for example, video, digital video is a digital media, it could be uh, transmitted not only by social media, but on TV, uh, uh, movies, etc. And there is a new technology, a new tool that is extraordinarily effective, more and more effective, called the deepfake, which is the, uh, the constitution of totally fake videos, but that cannot be or are very difficult now. And each month, it's, it's very recent, started really in 2016. Each month, it's better. You know, there is a kind of a competition between various uh, research centers, not mentioning the bad, the bad guys. And it is impossible to distinguish, and in an electoral campaign, it could be very effective. Uh, and we could have a video of uh, Thierry de Montbrial here in Marrakech having a discussion with uh, one of the uh, VIP present here and plotting some major operation to uh, against the French president, for example. <laughs> uh, and, uh, it could be, you, it, you, it, you would have the, it will be you as you are now and with your voice, it's uh, impossible to differentiate. So we need, we have to face that. So manipulation, so you see here, we have a total integration of the traditional fake news or through the social media and of hacking because it is a digital technique. So, and it uses, uh, uh, for the experts, it uh, use, uh, a new tools, very recent tool of deep learning and artificial intelligence called generative adversarial networks. You know, the réseau adverse uh, antagonistes génératif uh, en, en français. So, what to do? Uh, how, how what has been the various strategies to react to these threats? And here we have, uh, in terms of uh, major powers, there are different emphasis. The Americans, for many years have mainly focused on intelligence, 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 to collect every possible data, far more than they can process, but they wanted to, knew, to know everything. And uh, this has been denounced by Snowden, as you know, with the excesses that we know, since uh, the, uh, the NSA was trying to get informed on uh, the uh, private discussions of the chancellor discussing uh, uh, the, day, uh, the menu of a dinner with her husband, or uh, uh, the uh, uh, and also to penetrate the uh, uh, information, center, information system of uh, the Elysee. You know. So all of that has been, in my view, a little clearly excessive, not very friendly. Uh, but while the Americans were focusing mainly on uh, intelligence, uh, other powers were fo focusing on manipulation of information, and they started earlier. Uh, and uh, and so this explains the strategic surprise and the uh, of the Americans while they, they found uh, the situation to which they were confronted in, 2000, uh, in 2016. The Russians uh, and the Chinese as very early uh, in uh, two, uh, big, uh, beginning in, the, in, the, in the, the beginning of the 2000, even the late 1990s, understood the ability of uh, cyber, both through hacking and through social media manipulation, late, a little later social media manipulation, uh, to gain strategic advantage. And uh, they have done that with different ways. The, the Russians are very bright and very brilliant. 
Uh, I don't think they are spending enormous resources. By the way, the Russian defense budget is one of the most cost-effective of wor the world. You know, uh, you know that France and Germany together, uh, their budget is clearly above the Russian defense budget. You know. uh, I don't think that we have exactly the same uh, uh, military effectiveness for a variety of reasons. So the Russians are very cost-effective and they are very cost-effective in cyber and they have very good brains. You know. uh, the Chinese have a we are using just the mask? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, if you can sure. yeah, okay. conclude. So the Chinese are focusing on intelligence and the hierarchy of the powers is different because you have quantity and you have the Russians and the Americans. It means you have high quality people and in uh, large numbers. And you have large numbers with a little less quality than Chinese. You have a small country like uh, Israel, which is a major cyber power in terms of brains. So now, transition. to conclude, uh, to conclude, uh, I have one, two minutes. We, the threat is rising, and I know that uh, uh, Mr. Chetrit will, dem will de demonstrate that. And for that, we need two things to face these growing threats, because we, the more we digitalize our companies, and here I totally slightly disagree with Patrick in the sense that the more we digitalize, the more vulnerable we are. And the for to face the threats, the private companies alone cannot face them because only the states have the intelligence because threat intelligence is essential. If you don't know who attacks you, you cannot protect yourself. Not only you cannot respond, but you cannot protect yourself. And so in a growing interaction between French, the national or international style, like uh, European agencies or French, and com private companies is necessary. It is necessary to have a doctrine not of deterrence. Deterrence in, deterrence in cyber has no, is meaningless because deterrence is uh, no war. You don't fight because you know that should you fight, it would be mutual annihilation. In cyber, you have to demonstrate daily your capability. Technology is evolving. So, it is not deterrence in cyber, and we may discuss that. It's a continuous, I would say, reactive defense. You have to f identify your adversary and to punish it, not to, not to escalate, to demonstrate that you know who, he, who the adversary is and to punish, it, to punish him. And so this is essential. If we don't have that, we are paralyzed. Just to give you an example concerning all European countries. Maybe we can. Yes, one word. Yes, for example, maybe for the Q&A session, if, sure. you, if, if you don't mind. Sure, I will just, just to say that it's a major threat. And you have to know that in the European infrastructures, uh, uh, many uh, uh, growing numbers of so-called prepositionings. It means implants. It means all style state manipulated hacking in order to prepare future attacks, but which means that our energy infrastructure are vulnerable, have been noticed, and they are growing. They are not because these, people, these nations are preparing war against Europe. It is just to intimidate and to tell our leaders, you know, we can just cut uh, uh, power supply, electricity, uh, for 24 hours, you know, as it has happened in some countries in Europe recently. You know, we know in the East in Europe. So this is a major challenge. We need a real defense. We need, we Europeans, to do far more than we are doing. And we need an international organization to deal with cyber risks that are growing. And this is what President Macron started to launch with his appeal for peace and for security and trust uh, in cyberspace uh, just uh, almost one year ago uh, in the, during the, the Paris uh, Peace Forum. Thank you very much, Henri. I'm sorry, but I want to give. I want to give the chance to Mayor. I think you, you prefer to, to speak at the podium. I thought during your, your say there is a point of debate between Patrick and jean louis about the role of companies. So very briefly, maybe on that, could you could, could you could you elaborate? You know, because if, if, if you want to do it now. Or yeah, yes, please uh, do. Okay. So uh, very rapidly, because I mentioned right. It's a very uh, critical aspect. So uh, we have collaboration with uh, a state agency, France's ANSI, uh, that is providing us some information, CGHQ in the UK as well, 
It's not available everywhere. India, we have uh, 110,000 people, has zero information. But this is complemented by the industry. We have our own large companies, such as Microsoft, Cisco, <laughs> IBM, that process billions of events per day, are providing us with intelligence on the characteristic of a different uh, attack. Uh, we have a partnership, an industry partnership, that has been launched by Brad Smith, the general counsel of Microsoft, called TechAccord, that is here to bring together uh, there are about 60 companies where we, we sit together and we exchange best practices and intelligence because ultimately it's a cost of doing business for us. Huh? There is no competitive advantage to gain. And for the fun part, there is a hacker super league. So you can look, uh, you're informed. So today I can tell you uh, the group called Russian Bear is the number one in the super league because they can penetrate and migrate in a system in 30 minutes and the number two needs two hours and a half. So uh, this, this is how it's crazy, but that's the way it works. So you, yes, we need the state, but the industry and the enterprise are developing their own needs. I will let Jean-Louis uh, respond to that af after the presentation by, by Ben. The score is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to explain in very simple words what's going on in cyber. As our moderator said six years ago in Monaco, I made a session about cyber, which I explained the threat of cyber and the bad news are that situation can be much, much worse. If I told you at that time that you have to take consideration that whatever you write in your iPhone, SMS, your calls, anything, where, where you are, everything could be seen by anybody who make a little effort. Now, it's not only they can do that, do that they can even reverse your phone in order to take pictures from wherever you are because they can reverse the camera and can, from your camera, take uh, pictures when you are, listen to you. Doesn't matter where you are in meeting at your home, they can listen to you from far away. I wish, uh, Thierry, that I have once the opportunity to bring him a company from Israel which show, demonstrate to people here in the room that they can control any phone in the room. They do it only for volunteers and show you they can see anything, anything you do in five minutes. So I I'm trying to explain what happened since the last six years. The computer system had been making a great and rapid progress. It's really unbelievable how fast it goes. And there is a graph, a this chart that shows what happens to computers to simplify it. It's called, there is the Moore law. And to simplify it, Moore law says that, as a matter of fact, if you can see here, the simplified version is the law states that the processor speed or overall processing power of computers will double every two years. So since 1960, when this law had been done by Moore, the power of computer grow in 50 billion times. This is a fact. That's what I showed before. In a modern car today, modern car, your cars, there are more than 100 chips. In my phone, today, the computer, the power computing of my iPhone today, or your iPhones, is greater than the power of the Apollo 11 program computer, of the, of the spacecraft of Apollo 11. It shows you that things are changing very, very fast. Now, why, what, what happens, in matter of fact, in, in the world in computing? Uh, in the past, the infrastructure, system, the infrastructure systems were not computerized. As a matter of fact, people did not think about it. And the only way to hurt those systems or to touch them is by attack, direct attack. If you want to ruin, let's say, a nuclear power plant, you have to go there and bomb it. You cannot do it from any other way. Especially the same with electrical system, electrical power stations, water, whatever you want, anything. Today, things have been changed because of computerized. And then most of the countries did not computerize their uh, systems. But during this, since 1980, it was the beginning of various system computing in the world. And the, infra the infrastructure system in most countries has been computerized. That includes banks, government system, government agencies, data, telephone uh, uh, telephone exchange, they computerize almost, almost everything. Now, when everything had been computerized, 
it creates dependence between people and computers. And the bad guys said to themselves, now if there is so much data and possibilities, why we can't use it for our benefit? That matter of fact, what started when the cyber started. Since they digitized the telephone exchange and the records of institutions, the bad guys started to work and develop, in matter of fact, the cyber. Now, what is, in matter of fact, what is uh, cyber? Since the domination technology of the century is computing, so the cyber, in matter of fact, is computer against society. That is what is meaning of cyber, which means people using the computer systems in the world against the people themselves for their benefits. As they said, the extortion to attack other places, to spy, to do anything else. Until 2010, cyber was only aware of the intelligence services in the world. Nobody cared. Until 2010, nobody cared about cyber. There were several countries, only around 10. Israel was one of them that began to concern themselves about cyber. But still, if I looking at Israel, Israel computer warfare unit was established in the intelligence of Israel only in 1993. This was the beginning of taking care of cyber. It should be remembered that until 1995, every country was developing different uh, computers. It's not there were no standardization of computers. Only in 95, they start to make standardization of all the computers. It's, it creates a lot of problem to those who are fighting against it because you have to learn every computer separately, how it works, how it builds, how you can touch it, etc. When it becomes standardized, it can make the life of everybody much more simple. Only then, in 2002, because of the development, Israel established the ISA, is the Israel Security Authority, Establish the NIS, which is National Infrastructure Security, which means Israel decided we're not leaving our infrastructure to be attacked by other people or by other countries. Listen to this. Today, one boy of 20, 22 years, which is good in cyber, is much more powerful than a full arm, army of army. You don't need tanks or aircrafts or missiles to make total chaos and destruction of a country. You can do it from your keyboard from home, if you have the ability. So things have been changing the world in how do you look at dealing with problems or with attacks. Because Israel is having something like 100,000 attacks per day in regular days. In time of war, we have one million attacks per day. Israel had to be one of the best, otherwise we cannot survive. Therefore, we have to develop our power of cyber very, very strongly. 2010 was published worldwide, the cyber, by the Stuxnet world. If you remember, the world turned upside down. Why? Because suddenly, somebody from far away ruined all the centrifuge of Iran, preventing them from enrich uranium from far away. Nobody's been there. Nobody touch it. Nobody attack it. And still, they ruin all the infrastructure of Iran for producing, for enriching uranium. I, I'm not saying who did it, because they're speaking about, <laughs> not us, say United States. Um, which means physical damage had been done, but nothing had been stolen. It just show the world that it is possible to act from away. Therefore, Israel, cyber in Israel decided to, to make an ecosystem which really will take care of all the problems of cyber. And really went very strongly. To, it come, as you see, it come to, it means giving budget to research for universities, for industry, for people putting hours of study of cyber in high schools, supporting all the system, managing it, synchronizing it in order that everybody will know what anybody else will do, and it really worked quite well. And I must uh, just bring you some data about this in Israel. It's just a few data which is very, very interesting. Can you stop that? 
Yeah, not too much, it's very short. Um, for example, the Israel export of civilian goods and services in cyber was $7 billion this year, which is 8% of the global market of Israel, of the world. Israel is just 0.1% of the world. Cyber business sector investment in the world are very large. Of these total investments, development center, venture funds, etc., 18% come to Israel. Because Israel is considered to be one of the centers of the very strong centers of cyber. In two, between 2012 and 2018, cyber products grow in Israel in 600%. We were not the first in the world, but among the first. But we were the first to take the cyber out of the closet, to show it to the world. Now, if I'm looking ahead in just one, two. Uh, if I may, to your concluding points to save time, yeah. you know, for the q and I know, but two yeah. more. Uh, I think it will be okay. Snowden affair, it's okay. the first one. Snowden affair was exploded in 2014 and 15. Matter of fact, when Snowden affair came out, it created automatically tension, very high tension between security and privacy. Because what Snowden published was the fact that the United States was following everyone, reading all their mails, everything else, and they know this information. And this created a big uh, un unbelievement in governments. Therefore, in order to solve this problem in Israel, that's what we suggest to do. Israel suggested to, and it did, establish a separate unit on three principles. First one is, in a modern country, the intelligence agencies will not track civilians. Second, establishment, establishing a new civilian body which does not belong to intelligence because civilian cooperation is needed. And third, the body will not belong to law enforcement. We mean if you want really to protect your people and your country from attacks from outside, how do you do it? Even if you create such a unit, you cannot read any mail. Now today, this is the future, we're coming to the last one, the future, you cannot read the mail, we we'll do it by uh, artificial intelligence, AI and machine learning, which means I just describe it generally. Suppose there is a machine that read all the internet transformation in Israel, anything, very fast, not like in Wimpen, immediately, in a very, very high uh, rapid system. And they popped out only those emails or things that create some suspicions. Those are transferred to the bodies to be detected. Otherwise, you don't feel it. So it could be done. And that is exactly the last one in the future. Looking ahead, the ability to protect the network can only be done through artificial intelligence and learning machine. Therefore, in the world today, there is a big competition to, on this area and countries are investment, investing billions and hundreds of billions of dollars in order to develop what we call quantum computers. Quantum computers, I will not, I will not enlarge eh, in it, but just to give you an example, Google was published lately that they established that they succeed to operate a quantum computer with 53 qubits, which made a calculation within 200 seconds which will take the largest and the biggest computer in the world of NASA, which will take him 10,000 years to be done. Why 100 seconds? Because that's the only time they can really hold the computer quantum to work. But May it is a matter of time, I'm finishing. Yes, it is a matter of time until they will create a quantum computer which hold on. When that happens, the sky will not be the limit because things would change everything in the world, including your life. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Well, the situation is the following. I was asked to finish on time, and we have seven minutes for the Q&A. So I would suggest the following. I will gather questions to give the chance to each speaker to have one or two minutes, one or two minutes, not more, please to try to, to pick up the question the privilege. So I'll start with uh, Renaud and uh, Jean-Claude after that. Uh, obviously, be brief in your question, but I know that Re Renaud is expert oui, on that. Oui, c'est uh, Renaud Girard, je suis le chroniqueur intellectuel du Figaro. Juste une question, uh, Monsieur Nicolet. 
Euh, après la Deuxième Guerre mondiale, la France, et même d'autres pays européens, ont été capables de suivre les Américains dans l'industrie moderne de l'époque, qui était l'aéronautique. On avait les avions égaux aux Américains. Là, visiblement, est-ce qu'on euh, abandonne quoi On est trop en retard. Les autres euh, investissent euh, euh, trop par rapport à nous, ont trop de capacités. Est-ce qu est, est, est que nous, Français ou Européens, on a vraiment perdu cette, euh, cette bataille où on va arriver euh, à faire, comme on a fait des, euh, des, Mirage, des, des Mirage 3 et des, des Airbus, à revenir dans la course où c'est fini Jean-Claude, and... Je prends ensuite la question de Joseph. Il y a une question au milieu aussi. Oh, oh, yeah. yeah, just uh, going back to Mayer and the comment he made about the Snowden story. Uh, in the United States, we believe that we have the right to have our communication to be protected from government. And uh, the debate uh, at the occasion of the Snowden story was whether we can listen to anybody or the government can listen to anybody, can listen to American citizens, which creates even more problem. And if you listen to citizens, at least, and particularly for American citizens, you should have a judge reviewing the process and the warrant to be established. Joseph, and then to the first round, Madame. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, my question goes immediately to Jean-Louis uh, Gerigorin. Jean-Louis, I would like to ask you after your presentation, you said that we are witnessing, we are going through a new kind of war. And the more digitalized you are, the more vulnerable. My question is very concise and brief. What are, and it's, uh, I'm following John Sawyer's, the intervention of John Sawyer's in the previous panel. What are the means and the tools for a democracy in order to prevent cyber attack? Be I mean, beyond and without infringing on the state of law. Thank you very much. So I will go for the last question, Madam. Yeah, that was really my question too, because uh, uh, when we started speaking about cyber attacks and all that, and you hear about ransom, you hear about all kinds of things, but when it goes to the core of democracy, and that I was really uh, terrified when I was watching the, the uh, Robert Mueller's uh, audition when he was saying right now we are under a threat of uh, uh, the uh, next elections, next election being attacked after what happened in uh, 2016 and he, they felt so powerless so you say uh, how can we feel, so it's exactly the same question is there, is there a way to prevent it and my question is to uh, Mr. Maishetrick because they look, they seem to have a specific solution to that, and to Jean-Louis Gergora. Thank you. So I return now to the, to the panelists. Uh, Maya, would you like to go first? Yeah, okay. For a couple uh, of minutes? Sure. I think that uh, in order to prevent, to the lady, in order to prevent what you were suggesting, Wait. country have to be very aware to the situation and protect its own people. That's what we're do, try, doing in Israel. Not only for the government, we do it also for private companies. So if, if we do it for private companies. For example, if we want to prevent attacks against our banks, we have the ability really to prevent it because we prepare ourselves from advance not to allow possibility of attacks banks in Israel. So we have to be prepared to prepare. You, when you make elections in the United States, of course you can manipulate it very easily today. And that's what they did in the last elections, according to the press. So the United States have to prepare its own system to not be open to attacks. That could be in your car, in airplanes, everywhere. As a matter of fact, you can arrive everywhere and ruin everything from far away, unless you put making protections. The protection is the other side of the cyber attacks. You have to be protected very strongly. Thank you. Patrick. Uh, yeah, very briefly, I think, some battles are lost, yes. The, the, the public cloud one is gone. Uh, there is too much money uh, into it and uh, we don't have the market. Uh, th this is gone. Uh, but the technology is evolving. So there are new battleground, uh, and I, I'll be brief. So I think the first one is data. Uh, we are not paying enough attention about how we want to manage data. We have a response, we heard it this morning, protect the citizen. Yeah, but uh, there is, 
the source of value. It's not value in itself. This is a source of value. We, we should have a better plan because if we don't have it, uh, then there is a second aspect where we can invest and win uh, market share. It's uh, software and in particular artificial intelligence. But without trusted data, it's very difficult just to have the engine. Uh, to, uh, you must have something to extract value from. And then on the infrastructure part, we alluded to rapidly this morning, uh, there is uh, the emergence of uh, edge computing. Uh, edge computing is linked to the deployment of sensors everywhere. So meaning there will be a distribution of intelligence there. And, and uh, with uh, the new wireless technology called 5G, that brings two things. Uh, first, the virtualization layer, and then the ability to manage uh, seamlessly all your networks. And I think here we have the opportunities uh, to regain uh, some, some position. But uh, the thing we've been discussing, it's, uh, it's, it's gone now. Just leave with it. Thank you, Jean-Louis. Just, I think that the worst, uh, is, the worst is ahead. And I'm not convinced at all that artificial intelligence and these new tools will, be, will, more, will help more the defense than the aggression. I think that the aggressors will benefit more from artificial intelligence, especially to disguise themselves. Concerning your question, Renaud, and the uh, question of Joseph, we need to, de to do far more. For the time being, if we look at the products in cybersecurity, both for industry, for governments, they are not French. We are in a situation where the French Air Force would be entirely made with uh, uh, foreign airplanes. The tools, the main tools are either Israeli or American. So, the, and so this is a general challenge for Europe. And we have to build an ecosystem between startup and large companies that we have failed to do so until now. And second, we need to be far better to have what I call reactive defense. It means when we are attacked, when our companies, our private companies, are attacked by state actors, you know, there is an imbalance, you know. And we need to have a better protection from the state, a better interaction with the state, or several states, for the time being, the Europeans should work together, especially for threat intelligence. Because if we don't know who attacks us, if we have not evidence of who attacks us, we, in fact, we have already lost, you know. Pure protection is not enough. We need a reactive defense and at the French level, but also at the European level. Thank you. May I? Just one sentence. Word. Since we're speaking about artificial intelligence, which is the future of computing, there is a very famous people like Bill Gates, uh, Stephen Hawking, which says that they look at artificial intelligence as a uh, danger to the existence of the human being. Bon, je crois que tout le monde aura apprécier la tonalité optimiste de, ce, de cette session. Et donc, c'est le moment de remercier nos panélistes. <rire>